Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome back to our uh, Department of Medicine Academics Feast. Uh, Hi, this is, uh, hello. Okay. This is the last of our uh, lecture series under uh, critical care for medicine PGs, men specifically for, and anyone who is interested in the critical care topics. Uh, for today, we have uh, an, uh, renal support in critical care, critically ill patients as a topic. Uh, but sir, we'll also be having some addendum to yesterday's lecture, which is neurocritical care. Uh, any doubts, please feel free to ask, sir, uh, unmute yourself or please uh, put down your questions in the chat box. These lectures will soon be uploaded on our Department of Medicine YouTube website. And if any doubts or queries or if you want an access to this presentations, please mail to metro at cmcmello.ac.il. Sir, I, I, once again, thank you, sir, for all your lectures that, and, that we had all through all this past four to six weeks. Um, and I hope to have further sessions with you, sir. And uh, thanks on behalf of Medicine too, again, and Medicine, the whole department, and especially from the, Dr. Tambu, sir. Um, over to you, sir, for good lecture today. Thank you. Good afternoon. Just want to start off by thanking uh, a few people. One is Dr. Ramya, who started the first uh, seeding of this whole set of lectures. Dr. Tambu for uh, pushing it forward and organizing it, and you, Dr. Anju, for executing it so efficiently. And of course, the telemedicine unit for all their fantastic support in uh, getting these lectures across to all of you. Thank you all. And as usual, I'll start off this lecture with a bit of an addendum to yesterday's lecture, because uh, I did not deal with how to manage the raised ICP in that lecture. So here it is, just three slides. Basically, to control ICP, avoid any impediments to the jugular venous drainage, improve venous drainage by keeping the head up, avoid factors causing sharp rise in ICP, mechanical factors as well as neurological factors. And in ventilatory settings, very high PEEP is not good, but you must use reasonable PEEP if it is important to maintain, I mean, if it's uh, essential to maintain oxygenation. Keep PaCO2 within the lower limits of acceptable. Hyperventilation, not for long term, only short term while awaiting definitive surgery. PaO2, maintain oxygenation. Increase the blood osmolality either by mannitol or hypertonic saline. Details are given. Sodium, avoid hyponatremia. Keep it slightly on the higher side and avoid rapid, avoid rapid changes in sodium. Steroids only for tumor related edema. Of course, you can drain CSF and surgical interventions. So these are the methods by which you can control the intracranial pressure. So that is all for this. Just add it on to your previous lecture. And uh, I will uh, go on to my next set of slides, basically on renal support. Okay. Now the kidney is the organ which has a possible way to support it. And uh, it's important to recognize acute kidney injury early. And there are many criteria available. I'm not going into the pluses and minus of the criteria, but from a practical point of view, if you have a urine output less than half ml per kilogram per hour for six hours of your creatinine is rising, either one and a half or doubling over baseline if your baseline is available or rising more than 0.3 milligrams per cent over six hours. Then strongly consider AKI, but you must always evaluate for pre-renal factors. Mean arterial pressure needs to be maintained. You need higher MAP for chronic hypertensives. Evaluate the fluid status and you can do your spot urine or fractional excretion of sodium to find out whether it's pre-renal or renal. Post-renal, you must make sure that the obstruction is uh, not a component because that uh, treatment modality is different. Once you have decided AKI, then you have to decide on the indications for dialyzing this patient. One is fluid overload, which is uh, not responding to diuretics. And of course, this will go into the lungs and interfere with oxygenation. Hyperkalemia, either an absolute value or rapidly rising like in myoglobinuria. Metabolic acidosis, especially if it is interfering with inotrope action. And even if the PP is not optimal, you may have to start CRRT to maintain the pH within a level within which inotropes can act. So that might call on for some aggressive dialysis. 
Of course, there are dialyzable toxins and early initiation in cases where you expect AKI to occur, like massive myoglobinuria, where you know the kidney is going to fail. The blood urea level by itself is not an indication, it's a relative indication, but a low value should not be used to delay dialysis. And remember, dialysis is not as fast as starting a patient on a ventilator. You need to have a line in and then you have to get the equipment and it's a little more tedious and there's a bigger lag time with initiating dialysis. So decide early. Now I'll just go some basic concepts of dialysis. Convection and ultrafiltration are terms which imply the flow of a cell solute across a semi-permeable membrane along with the flow of solvent. So the solute is dissolved in the sol solvent and that solvent flow is proportional to the membrane pressure. Whereas diffusion is flow of a solute across a semi-permeable membrane down the concentration gradient of the solute. So the first depends on the flow of solvent. The second depends on the gradient of the solutes. So this is ultrafiltration and it's also known as convective transfer. Basically pressure on one side of the membrane pushes fluid out and the whatever is dissolved in the fluid goes out to the other side in a process known as solvent drag and then is removed. And this process is used in a procedure known as cuff, slow continuous ultrafiltration, where your only aim is to remove fluid, like in a cardiac failure. Now, the second associated term is hemofiltration, where you, when you remove the fluid, you also replace with a clean fluid, and thereby you are removing mainly the solutes. So basically you are taking out fluid from the blood with all its constituents and replacing it with the necessary constituents, which is clean. So this procedure is known as hemofiltration. And if you give back the same amount of fluid, it is the net neutral balance. So you removed only the solute, but it is not very efficient compared to dialysis, but it is slow and it maintains hemodynamic stability. For example, in a CRRT treatment, your hemofiltration rate is one liter per hour and the fluid removal is 200. If you pull out 1,200 and replace one liter, you remove 200 ml of fluid as a net balance. But the one liter you replace is clean without any urea and other metabolic waste products. So that's hemofiltration, similar to ultrafiltration, but you're replacing it with a replacement fluid. Now you have dialysis which imply which uh, the other term is diffusive transfer you have a semi permeable membrane one side of which has large amount of solute say it's potassium or urea the other side is free of that or has a lower level and the solutes move along the concentration gradient this is what happens in dialysis and the dialysis fluid goes counter current to blood flow in the opposite direction i'll tell you in a moment why why this is and solutes passively diffuse down the concentration gradient, like potassium, urea, and creatinine. Whereas those which are low in the blood is replaced, like calcium and bicarbonate for acidosis. Now, if this is used over 24 hours, is known as continuous renal replacement therapy. It is very useful for hemodynamically unstable patients because regular dialysis or sometimes even sweat can cause drops in blood pressure as the volumes are removed. SLED is a high, is a in between CRRT and regular dialysis. It's done intermittently, but for longer periods of time than regular dialysis, which is about three to four hours, but much shorter than the CRRT. Now let us have a look at why this dialysis fluid goes counter current. Now this is co-current, not counter current. You have a, uh, cold water through the blue pipe and hot water through the pink pipe. And the pink pipe is inside the blue pipe and heat is exchanged. And uh, when you come out, the, the cold water comes out, it's warmed up. If you look at the graph, hot in, hot out, there's a gradual drop in temperature. Cold in, cold out, there's a gradual rise in temperature. Cold stream outlet can never rise higher than the hot stream outlet because they're parallel, they're going together, and heat transfer is from high to low. Now see what happens in a counter current. Counter current is you have the warm in one direction and the cold in the opposite direction. Now if you look at the graph, if you look at this, 
drop in temperature of the hot similar drop cold is starts here and then rises and remember this tail end can be lower than this so your cold out can be higher than the hot out because it's counter current think about this and that is the reason why you use counter current flow because you can take out much more solutes in a counter current direction so this is the summary of the four types of mechanisms used ultra filtration hemodialysis hemofiltration and hemodiafiltration where the both the processes are combined now the standard dialysis technique nowadays in the icu uses a cartridge which has uh, many many hollow fibers which acts as a dialysis membrane where if you use the human peritoneum as the dialysis membrane by putting fluid inside the peritoneal cavity it's known as peritoneal dialysis it's not recommended in the critically ill patients it is much lower plus it pushes up the diaphragm interferes with ventilation and it's not uh, controllable in fine amount so it is not recommended and studies have shown its outcome is poor so vascular access in the critical ill it may be a renal failure patient who already has an existing av fistula or a perm cath which comes who comes in and therefore you can use the same one or it may have to insert a new access which is almost always veno venous can be the internal jugular or femoral subclavian sometimes kinking is a problem so flow may be inadequate so for dialysis we prefer the internal jugular or femoral so when you want to remove primarily fluid you use ultra filtration if you want to remove fluid and solute it is hemo filtration and if you want to remove predominantly solute you use dialysis if you want to remove both faster you use hemo dial filtration and machines nowadays you can just program it just like you would, uh, would uh, punch in the numbers for a ventilator and it adjusts adjusts the blood flow to whatever is necessary now in olden days artery and vein used to be accessed separately and so uh, you there were terminology such as ca vht like continuous uh, arteriovenous hemofiltration or cv vht but nowadays all access is vein and vein mostly with artery out and vein in the hospital and vein in and vein out is key. recommended access no, 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 in the one the patient dialysis or combined here is a summary of the main three modes the blood flow if you note will be much higher in a hemodialysis dialysate flow much higher in hemodialysis and as you come to crrt you have much lower flows hemodynamic stability is very good if you use crrt very poor for hemodynamic yet hemodialysis and uh, obviously for a walking patient it's per week but for icu patients is either 24 hours or 6 to 12 hours more and more pay, uh, icus are coming around to the idea of using sled for maintenance dialysis while in the icu anticoagulation is usually not needed for the hemodialysis and hemo and sled but definitely necessary for crrt so that is as far as renal support is concerned recognition and initiation now a couple of other things related to renal failure one is that when you put in a line you might find that a person who is in chronic renal failure has platelet dysfunction and to correct the platelet dysfunction you can either transfuse fresh platelets but you can also give ddavp which is a synthetic analog of arginine and vasopressin which can revert the platelet dysfunction in uremia i have given you the dose there just keep that in mind in case you do not have fresh platelets and the second thing to consider in patients with aki is the use of drugs now remember that calculation of egfr in a critically ill patient is not valid because the uh, gfr is a dynamic situation it uh, is either deteriorating or improving 
and uh, you cannot calculate an EGFR like you do for a chronic renal failure patient who has got a stable creatinine. Now remember that the loading dose of any medication is distributed in the volume of distribution. So this does not change in acute renal failure unless there's a massive amount of fluid accumulation. So the loading dose of any medication is usually not changed. So you can go ahead and give the first dose. The maintenance dose changes depending on which route of elimination the drug takes. If it is renal based, you have to change the maintenance dose. This can either be a lower dose at regular at the same intervals or the same dose at a longer interval. And so the maintenance drug dosages have to be changed. If you can do a drug levels possible, please do. And remember, do not use low molecular weight heparins patients with AKI because the half-life is much more prolonged and you might find problems with bleeding. Okay, that concludes my renal support, a brief review. And uh, it is uh, mainly an applied uh, issue and uh, you need to know how to evaluate these patients before they actually go into full-blown parenchymal renal failure. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any questions? And feedback later if you can. Uh, I'm just typing in the uh, feedback link to you guys and it's also mailed and uh, WhatsApp to you guys for uh, feedback on today's and next day's lectures. Thank you for all your questions. It uh, helped me learn during the lecture. So we learned quite a bit from you and I had quite a lot of feedback from many people asking um, say it was a very much of a privilege to hear you sir back again. Well, I also learned a lot at the end of these lectures. Yeah, and then uh, all of us are going to be lucky to have these lectures being uh, revised and gone back to also when being uploaded on our website. Um, so if any queries on further questions, I'll mail it to you. Um, sure. Please, any of you have any questions, uh, mail to med2 at cmcvelo.ac.in. There are two books by Sir also on critical care. Um, oh, I can give that free. By the way, I've got soft copies of it. Ah, that's soft. That's a uh, very. I can much send it to your book. email. You can give it to anybody who wants free because sure. it's ten years old. So I don't know how much needs to be revised, but you can have it for what it's worth. Yeah, it's no one has updated after that. But... I'll yes. send it to your email. You can distribute it to who wants it. We'll do that, sir. So anyone who wants to get hold of the books, critical care books, or the uh, lectures that we had through all these last four, four to six weeks. Please message or mail to medtu at cmcvello.ac.in. Uh, hope to have uh, hope to have further inquiries uh, or further sessions with you, sir. And sure. um, thanks again, sir. I think uh, we'll wind up for today. If no further sessions, uh, further thank questions. you all very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you.